Uh, no, I, I, he, he does. Yeah, do you need to ask him something? Oh, I'll ask him. She's a one. Had astronomical societies. We meet here at the planetarium on the second Wednesday of each month at 7:30 p.m. So tonight I'm going to be doing the presentation, and it'll be talking about the planets. So there's still a few planets to see in our night sky, and I hope some of you saw the new moon last night. It was really beautiful. So the word planet. Is from the Greeks. If I can figure out which button to push. Yeah. Did, I, did I get it? Okay. And let's go way back in time to the Venus of Lascaux, which was carved onto a cave 40,000 years ago in France. And um, what this image is saying is that this is a pregnant woman holding a crescent moon with 13 notches in it. And, you know, maybe it's implying that woman is kind of like the moon. There's a cycle. The moon has an approximately 29-day cycle. And a woman does too. And at 13 years of age, a woman can give birth to a child. And at about 13 days is a full moon. So it maybe is implying something like that, but anyways, an ancient relationship between woman and the moon. Now, the Babylonians saw things a little bit different. They called this moon god, or he's riding on his boat, moon boat, across the sky, Sin. That's the Babylonian moon god. And uh, the Hebrews were attacked by the Babylonians and brought into capture into Babylonia. And uh, they didn't like that uh, moon god, Sin. So it became kind of a negative connotation. Now the sun is thought, was thought to have been pulled across the sky by a chariot of team of horses. And uh, oh, there's a lot of different sun gods there's Ra and Bel and Shamash and Melkarth, Surya, Hercules, Quetzalcoatl, Vratma, Mithras, and Sol. So a lot of different um, ideas about the sun, where it came from, what it does. And long ago, people carved statues and gave them names of after the planets. Like here is Mercury. Mercury was known to have wings on his feet, on his ankles. And sometimes there's wings up here on the side of his head. Because Mercury is a very speedy planet. It just shows itself for a few days and it's gone. And they were just mystified by it. But the important thing is that they turned it into these human attributes. There we go. Oop. And, oop, I'm sorry, I'm pushing the button too fast here for some. Oh, here's a painting of Mercury. And um, he's riding on his chariot, pulled by a team of horses. And Mercury was known to be very scholarly, a great painter, a scribe, a writer known for the liberal arts and discussions amongst liberals. So they gave human attributes to the planets. And this is in the Vatican, this ancient painting. Here's another one of Venus. She was seen as beautiful 
like Aphrodite, the Greek goddess. And even in the Bible, it mentions Lucifer. And that word meant phosphorus. And they saw Venus as a beautiful place, enchanting. There were ancient temples throughout Rome. This one was dedicated to Mars. Here we see Mars over here with the sword and the shield. And here's his sword, and he's ready to go to war. Mars and a nearby star, but sometimes Mars would be near, um, were given similar names. Oh, okay. Okay, how about this? Okay, uh, here is a temple to Zeus, an amazing temple in Baalbek, Syria, or Lebanon. And uh, it's still standing, this ancient structure, which housed a big bronze god symbol of Zeus. Now, Zeus is actually the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter is a corruption of the word Zeus Pater, which meant God the Father. So they saw Zeus in Jupiter as a big man, powerful and mighty. Oops. Oh, I pushed it again too many times. Uh, here's a temple to Saturn. So these were places that people could go and worship. The, the planets, the, they were seen as gods. And here's the Vatican back here, in the nearby. And, um, you know, they had uh, money exchange at the temples. You could leave some money for the planets. And this went on for a thousand years. Then right around the year 500 AD, there became a sudden dark ages, they called it, when Christendom took over everything. The church ruled, and it was suppressing people's creativity. And um, for a thousand or uh, 500 years, actually, during that time, there just wasn't significant artistry and new ideas. There was kind of a slump. And it does change right around the year 1000 when the Crusades start. But the Islamic world, right around the year 700, took advantage of this time during the Dark Ages, and they became really interested in learning. And uh, they studied manuscripts that were left in the Holy Land as they Islam moved into the Holy Land, and they started to document and, and write things down. Islam had a burst of creativity, um, mathematics, and some new science, new insights into the planets and things like that. They really documented everything very well. And then they after the Crusades, after about 1,000, they turned it around and introduced it back to Europe. And Europe said, hey, we kind of forgot about this back uh, when the gods looked over everything. And here you can see them. Here's the sun. Here's Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, and Mercury and Venus overlooking the sphere and uh, the earth was in the center, and the sun went around the earth. But um, Europe was just amazed that they had forgotten during the Dark Ages all of this learning that they could have experienced. And they, they were reminded that Saturn was the harvester, and here is Jupiter, the kingly, wise one, Mars the warrior, soul 
this bright light to everything. Luna, the goddess who rules over the moon. Mercury, the scholarly one. And Venus, the uh, beauty uh, of woman. And it reminded them about that. And even in the Vatican, you can see today some statues that are kind of reminiscent to this era when they thought the planets were gods. Here's one dedicated to Longinus, but it's a lot like Venus, you, I mean Mars. Here you can see an ancient Greek statue to Mars. Here's one that's like Venus. It's Veronica. She um, stood along the Via Della Rosa and put a, a cloth over Jesus' face and got an icon. So her name is Perfect Icon, Vero Icon. And that's still visible in the Vatican. And it was very controversial. The Vatican said, you know, this is a little bit racy. Um, but, uh, you know, they approved it. And you can see here's a statue to Venus, kind of similar. Here's one to Andrew. He was uh, crucified on an X, X shape. And uh, here's the ancient shape of, here's Jupiter, Jove. Jove, and you can see the ancient, that's about 1000 BC. They had the symbol of, v, of Jupiter and uh, X. And you can see the X shape here on Andrew. And then here's an ancient symbol of Saturn from the ancient Greeks. And you can see it with St. Helen holding the true cross. So some of those names didn't come out of the Bible. Only Andrew is mentioned in the Bible. So then around the year 1550, Copernicus comes out and says, you know what? The sun is at the center of the solar system, not the earth. And it, the earth goes around the sun. And, um, you know, that, would, that really uh, agitated the authorities, and they didn't like this new idea. So Galileo in 1600 or so makes the telescope, and he starts aiming it at the sky, at the night sky, and he starts writing things down. He wrote a little book called The Starry Messenger, and he explains in his book called The Dialogue of the, the Chief Two Systems of the World, from about 1650, he said, those are not gods, you imbeciles. Those are planets orbiting the sun. And it really just shook everybody up. They said, oh my goodness, what's this crazy guy saying? And he said, no, they are worlds in orbit around the sun like the earth. And Galileo made a sketch of the moon and he put it in his starry messenger and Sigoli borrowed it, put it on the base of the Virgin Mary. But it really changed everything when Galileo started talking about the science of the solar system. So now we know today the sun is a star. It's the nearest star to the earth. And it has a core where a lot of nuclear fusion is going on. And every second, millions of tons of hydrogen is fused into energy and light. And this is a prominence that you can see on the sun and the sun spots. So the sun is a very busy body with a core that is about the temperature of a 15 billion degree. And it has a lot of temperature on this outer corona area around the sun too. But it's always working. Of course, it doesn't take a break ever. <laughs> and there's a lot of magnetism inside this, the sun that is always changing the magnetic field. And when there's a, an area like this, that's where there'll be a sunspot. And where there's a sunspot, sometimes there's a, a, a leaping area of the sun. 
and the coronal mass ejection or CME, which creates the northern lights. So just to give you a sense of scale, let's take the Earth, compare it to Mars. No, that's Venus. And here's Mars over here and Mercury. And then we take the Earth and put it right here. In comparison to Uranus and Neptune, and then look at Saturn and Jupiter compared to the Earth. The Earth is tiny. And then we take Jupiter and put it over here. Compare Jupiter to the Sun and to the star Sirius. Then take Sirius and compare it to our Curus and Aldebaran. Then take Aldebaran, compare it to Betelgeuse and Antares. And Antares compared to DVCTI. You start to really realize how tiny we are. And here's the sun. You can barely see it, the spot, compared to a giant star called GY Canis Majoris. So the sun is always busy pouring out energy. And uh, we're alive because of it. It's everything. Now, we can take Mercury, the nearest planet to the sun, compare it to the Earth. And uh, it's small. Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter. Mercury is about 3,000 miles in diameter. So it's like the moon. It's a little bit bigger, but it's cratered. And it has a large crater area called the Caloris Basin. And in inside of Mercury is a molten mantle. But it doesn't have any volcanoes on Mercury. And uh, it's very hot. It's about 800 degrees. At night, it's cold. It's like 300 degrees below zero. So here's Mercury in comparison to the moon. You can see the moon is smaller. And here's some of the other planets. Ganymede is a moon of Jupiter. Titan of Saturn, Callisto of Jupiter, Io of Jupiter, Europa is around Jupiter, Titan from um, Uranus or Neptune, and Pluto and Titania. Here's the tiny Mercury in comparison to the front of the sun. Here's Venus, which has temperatures of 900 degrees. Uh, you know, it's not a lovely, beautiful goddess. It's actually hell. It is so hot there. It's runaway greenhouse effect. And it rains sulfuric and hydrochloric acid. The pressures are 90 times those of Earth. Any spacecraft that's arrived on Venus has been crushed. And it's kind of a weird world. It, um, has backwards rotation, and a day is longer than a year on Venus. There's cloud formations that have display this strange Y formation. And they're not really sure why, but it um, it's, it's uh, an interesting place full of volcanoes that are busy erupting and pouring gases into the atmosphere. And uh, here's this strange chalky white powder area on a hillside. Not sure what it is. Now this looks like a river running across country on Venus, but actually it's lava, a lava river running downhill. So Venus, unlike the gods of long ago, is not so enchanting after all. Here's some lava domes. But Earth is, uh, you know, just the best place of all in the solar system. We're lucky we, we live here. It's um, got a nice atmosphere, protects us from the dangers of the sun. And uh, here is the magnetosphere which gives us protection against solar rays, cosmic rays, and uh, is also the reason that we get the aurora 
the solar energy, a coronal mass injection, kind of goes down here and follows back up into the polar regions, calling, ca causing some um, il illumination of the gases in the atmosphere, kind of like a neon light. Here you can see the pole regions of the Earth. That's where the northern and southern lights occur. And that's where we get the aurora from, gases like nitrogen and oxygen. Earth is renowned for its hydrologic cycle. There's evaporation going on over the ocean. The clouds go above the cloud, the mountains, rains, and it runs off and then creates this great cycle. And uh, that's what keeps Earth going, a great place to live. There's also plate tectonics. This is the Atlantic rim right here. Right down the middle is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is pushing both ways. And then meanwhile in the Pacific is the Ring of Fire, where everything is pushing towards that Ring of Fire, causing volcanoes and earthquakes. Now the history of the origin of the moon is uh, from a planet hitting the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. They call this hypothetical planet Thea. Here's Thea hitting the Earth, and it splattered all kinds of debris and went into orbit around the Earth. And anything that is larger than 300 miles in circumference will turn into a sphere in space. And uh, the moon is bigger than that, so it turned into a sphere, and it took a long time, but that's how the moon originated. You know, at first it was just kind of a body with some big meteor impacts, lots of them. And uh, then some lava flows occurred on the moon and uh, things have uh, risen. There's been fracturing, rising of mountain ranges. And uh, you can see that on here. So now let's take a journey out to see Mars, the uh, warrior, the mighty Spartan of long ago, but we don't see that on Mars. We see a world that is kind of docile and uh, hostile to humans. Not a really a pleasant place. It does have polar caps and mountains. But um, Schiaparelli in 1877 was an Italian astronomer who thought he saw what he called canals on Mars, but it got mistranslated into channels. And they thought, oh, where well, there's channels, there's humans, there's life. So Percival Lowe got out his big refracting telescope and he looked and he too saw channels. And uh, you know, that great story by Orson Welles came out, War of the Worlds. And uh, oh, they came up with all kinds of ideas that there were Martians going to invade Earth and, uh, you know, it created some hysteria for a while. But in actuality, Mars is kind of dormant. And um, here is the mountain range called Olympus. And here's Olympus Mons, which is 60,000 feet, a huge volcano. Here's Valles Marineris. You could put New York right here and put... Uh, L.A. over here, this would go right across the United States. Here's um, Spirit, uh, an exploring robot looking on Mars, and it dug a trench a few inches down and found ice. So they came to realize that underneath the soil is ice mixed in with the dirt, and it all went down into the soil. So now... Here are these two rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance. And they have found that there was ample water and running rivers and floods and things like that on Mars long ago. And uh, they have even found in Jezero Crater some of the signatures of possible life 
um, like sulfates and uh, other of the fingerprints of potential life in, in habitable, habitable zones, but uh, they really haven't found the, the missing gun yet. This is how curiosity and perseverance were delivered by this rocket that lowered cables down and brought the lander, the robot down. Now there's two moons around Mars, Phobos and Deimos, and uh, they're most likely asteroids that were captured into their orbit. And these are really fascinating places. Hopefully they'll land a spacecraft and explore. They're really interesting. And asteroids are kind of interesting anyways. Now we're moving on to the king of the planets, the mighty Jupiter. And it is big. It's 88,000 miles in diameter. Here's the great red spot. This is over, well, you could put the Earth inside of here. So this is like eight to 10,000 miles across. And it's a 400 mile per hour cyclone. And uh, Jupiter is just rich with lots of clouds. And inside is a rocky core way deep down. Then the surrounding the core is liquid metallic hydrogen and then molecular hydrogen. And it's made up of methane and hydrogen, acetylene, sulfur. Um, so, and Jupiter has the distinction of turning fast. It rotates in 10 hours. So it creates this huge magnetosphere, which is extremely powerful. Any human being went too close into that magnetosphere would be killed within hours. It's just too much radiation. And this again shows some of the belting of Jupiter. This belt will go this way, this one goes this way. This one goes this way, this one goes this way. That's kind of how it works. And like I said, it rotates very fast. And it has amazing cloud patterns because of these fast moving clouds. Here's the polar region. You can use a shortwave radio and tune it to listen to Jupiter. It sounds like ocean waves. Now, one of the nearest moons to Jupiter is Io. And Io is known to have hundreds of volcanoes that are busy erupting, spewing sulfur into the sky. And it sometimes finds its way into Jupiter's clouds because the magnetosphere travels all the way to Io. I think Io looks a lot like a pizza. Maybe you're getting hungry. Here's an active volcano on Io. So this is a world that we probably will never step foot on. It's just too dangerous. And it's high temperature there and lots of volcanism. But this moon is more interesting. The next moon out is Europa. And scientists think that there's about 50 miles of ice, and then an ocean, two times the amount of water on Earth on this small moon. And Callisto is also a place where there's an ocean underneath the ice. But this ice is much older and, and darker because of its age. It's got a mixing of other materials like sulfur. Um, but uh, Callisto has the potential to have ice, I mean, um, some kind of creatures evolve underneath the ice and in the ocean. Ganymede is um, not much for to have water or an ocean underneath, but it does uh, show ancient ice flows, and uh, they can tell that it's it's moving on the surface because it uh, doesn't show many craters. They get worn away by ice movement. They think the whole 
Earth's outer skin of Ganymede rotates around the planet, slides. So Saturn is the second largest planet. Um, it's not a harvesting god. It's a gas giant, 77,000 miles in diameter. You could put the Earth right here, put the moon over here, and it would slide between the Earth and the moon. And it shows aurora activity. And you could fit the United States into this uh, Cassini's division. There's lots of storms on Saturn. It's similar to Jupiter. It has an iron, I mean, an icy rocky core and liquid metallic hydrogen, but not as much as on Jupiter, and then molecular hydrogen. And this is the difference between Jupiter. Here's the rocky core. Here's the liquid metallic hydrogen. Very large area, smaller on Saturn, but a larger core. There are storms on Saturn that would just send utter fear into us humans. This is bigger than the Earth. And spikes on the rings. Here's a lightning strike that's larger than um, the United States. Now there's an interesting moon of Saturn called Titan. And um, it's a world of water, or not water, liquid, but it's liquid methane. And it's about 300 degrees below zero. And there's active volcanoes. It's got an atmosphere. And it, it almost appears to be a place you'd like to go. Here, I'll show you another. Here's one of uh, like a river on Titan running down into a lake. And there's shorelines and beaches and, and ponds and running water, or not water, methane. Don't be fooled. It would be very dangerous to go to. But here's rounded boulders. So there must be erosion going on, running rivers, flooding, glaciers even, or something like that. Uranus and, and its uh, world is, has a tiny ring around it. It's about 30,000 miles in diameter. And sometimes there's some pretty big storms on Uranus. Inside is a rocky core surrounded by hydrogen and helium. Has some moons like Titania and Oberon. And here's Neptune in comparison to the Earth. The Earth is such a small, fragile little planet. It's easy to understand why it's vulnerable, because it is so tiny. And Neptune has a rocky or icy core, a mantle of water, ammonia, methane, an atmosphere of hydrogen, helium, methane. So not a real pleasant place to go, and it's very cold. But Uranus and Neptune are very similar. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about Pluto because it is such a fascinating place. It has probably a molten core, icy mantle surrounding it. And it's two worlds. Charon is the smaller moon and uh, Pluto is about 1500 miles in diameter large rocky core. So the, the two are in kind of a binary orbit. And this heats up Pluto so that it has volcanoes on it and glacial action. This is an ice flow. And here's some kind of a rock or something sliding on ice. And mountain ranges, here's Pluto taken from the New Horizons spacecraft, and an atmosphere of thin nitrogen. This almost looks like Earth. And Pluto's way the heck out there, four billion miles out. And uh, it's a fascinating world. We got totally 
blindsided by this one. And it's worthy of more exploration, and I'm sure it'll have it coming up in the future. Now, the reason Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet is because of its eccentric orbit. Um, it's at a real angle compared to the other orbits of the planets. And so they um, changed it to a dwarf planet. But it's an amazing place. So here's our solar system. No gods, no human-like attributes, but just planets that are really fascinating and great places to learn more about our solar system. And it turns out there's lots of other planets around stars, something like 4,000 now. Oh, Mike is in our audience here tonight. Uh, Mike and I have done many uh, little uh, teaching experiences with kids at schools. And uh, one time he and I were at a school and this kid raised his hand and said, uh, can you tell me what happened before the Big Bang? So sometimes we go down to Canal Park, set telescopes up, and take a look at these celestial bodies. And we set telescopes up here at UMD. One time or two times, we did some mock space missions outside of the planetarium. And you can see here, this uh, mock astronaut has his foot in the lunar soil. And when will that happen, actually? When will a human being take off his boot and put it into Mars soil or lunar soil? It's going to happen someday, as long as we can keep exploring the cosmos. Because there's a lot to learn yet. It's just beginning. And, uh, you know, but we once, once in a while, you got to do some hard work like road cleanup. But anyways, I appreciate your being a great audience. Any questions I could try to answer? Thank you, Braden. Yes, go ahead. What do you think, Braden? Would Pluto ever become a planet again? Um, no, just uh, not most likely. Most likely not, unless, like I said, it like appears to object. Yes, go ahead. Um, well, it's a liquid at 300 degrees below zero, and uh, I think it does. Uh, Braden, do you happen to know? Does anybody know? That's more of a chemistry kind of question. What's the freezing point of methane? Um, uh, negative 295. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Everybody drive safe. Thank you.